anatomy of the neck. So you see in the neck, like any other part of the body, we have muscles of the neck, we have bones, the cervical vertebrae, we have seven of them from C1 down to C7. Then we also have neurovascular bundles that include arteries. The major arteries of the neck, you know, they are common carotid arteries. The common carotid arteries on either side, you know, it divides into two, external carotid and internal carotid arteries. Similarly, we have the veins. We have the veins that drain the structures of the head and the neck before they finally go into the thorax to drain into the heart. So in the neck, we have what we call external jugular vein. We also have internal jugular vein. Similarly, we have nerves. Important nerves in there include brachial plexus, you know, from C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. They are just at the root of the neck here. They come, you know, from these roots of the spinal nerves. And then they now go into the upper limb to supply the upper limb. We also have what we call cervical plexus of nerves. So they are there distributed along the back of the head and along the, you know, neck. We also have some group of lymph nodes. These lymph nodes, they are divided into superficial group, you know, lines superficial on the neck. And also we have the deeper group of cervical lymph nodes. Similarly, we have glands. We have two most important glands. That is the thyroid gland that is located anterior to the thyroid cartilage, cartilage of the larynx. And also we have parathyroid glands, you know, the, at the back of the thyroid gland. And so we have these important structures. So if you want to discuss the clinical anatomy of the neck, you need to consider this. So the muscles can get, you know, torn during trauma. Like during endeavor fight, because that is the common event taking place in our own environment. The endeavor fight, once they use, they use knife, to cut across your neck, they may cut across the muscles. One of the important muscles, you know, that help in rotating our neck side by side, and also in nodding the head, you know, nodding it, uh, flexing the neck forward, or extending the neck backward, these muscles, you know, are important, especially the sternocleidomastoid muscles. And so if it has been cut, these movements are going to be affected. Similarly, they may also get inflamed as a result of diseases, you know, infections, you know, as a result of deep cut that, you know, have those microorganisms, which may now go and affect the uh, muscles. And the muscles, once they, in, they are inflamed, that is what we call myositis. So muscles inflammation, we call it myositis. Myositis is inflammation of the muscles. And again, the inf inflammation may be so much so that it may cause has formation, the pus that has been formed, you know, may get enclosed. Because, you know, the muscles have been enclosed by fascia around, you know, the fascia encloses the muscles, and so the pus may be enclosed, you know, around the muscles. So, by sodium, we have what we call pyomyositis. That means inflammation of muscles together with the pus accumulation. You get it. And so you would see that the area that is being affected is swollen. You will see the area is swollen <coughs> and it is uh, somehow warm when you touch that side, you know, and somehow painful when you compress or when you press that side. And so when the person wants to move with the neck, that person will be feeling pain because of that inflammation of the muscles. So it's not only sternocleidomastoid muscle that can be inflamed or infected by organisms. Other muscles of the neck can also get, you know, infected because we have so many muscles of the neck. Now all these infra and suprahyoid muscles that are also in muscles of the neck that can be, you know, inflamed. We also have the, we have the bones, the vertebral bones. You know, the vertebral bones, you know, they are irregular bones. They are arranged one above the other like that. So they 
can get fractured or get crushed during an accident. So by the time they get fractured or crushed, because of their close proximity with the spinal cord, they may, the pieces of those bones may go and impinge or injure the spinal cord and cause damage to either one or more spinal nerves related to that fractured bone or even the spinal cord itself at the area of the fracture of that vertebral bone. So the bones can also get inflamed, you know, the inflammation of the bones as a result of diseases like tuberculosis. You know what is called pulmonary tuberculosis. The pulmonary tuberculosis can also affect the vertebral bones, either the cervical region of the neck or any other part of the vertebral column. So the TB can affect the bones whereby it can cause, you know, inflammation of the bones, what you call osteoarthritis of the vertebral bones of the cervical region or of the neck region. So somebody may have a fracture of the transverse processes of the cervical vertebral bones and it may get healed instantly. But in the next 20, 30 years, the person may come back with paralysis of his own body. Why? It's as a result of the callous formation of the area of the fractured bone that will now have problem on that may now go and damage the spinal cord or may, you know, uh, injure the spinal cord or may injure certain spinal nerves along that side. So now, fracture of the cervical bones is something that one cannot play with because after the fracture might have healed, later on the person may come back with, you know, some, you know, paralysis of the either the upper limb or maybe certain part of the upper limb, depending on the involvement of the bones. Similarly, the arteries. During fights with weapons like the sharp knives or sharp objects, if the cut is deep, it may cut across the common carotid artery, even though it is deeply situated into or inside the carotid sheath, but the cut may go, or even bullet, bullet shot can also, you know, break the internal carot external, uh, carot common carotid artery or any of these branches, that is the external or the internal. And so that may definitely be dangerous because you know it is a very large artery that is responsible for taking blood to the cerebral hemisphere and also to the outside of the head and the neck. You get it. The internal carotid artery supplies the blood inside the cranium, including the brain and the other part of the brain. And the external carotid artery supplies structures around the head and the neck. So any of these arteries, if it is damaged, can cause a severe bleeding, and the bleeding may be to death. Similarly, the veins, you know, we have external jugular vein that is superficial along the side of our neck. Before it finally goes into the subclavian veins of either side, the external carotid artery, you know, pierces it pierces one fascia, what we call, you know, cervical fascia. The cervical fascia now, as this external jugular vein, vein pierces it, the edge of the vein around that side is open. So much so that once there is a cut there, you know, the opening of that vein around its attachment or around its entrance to the fascia of the neck, that area will be open. And so once you breathe in, like this, you breathe in oxygen, the air may be taken into the external jugular vein, into the heart. So there's going to be what you call air embolism. That may kill the person. You get my point? Because once you breathe in air from your nose into your lungs, that's what, you, what we call negative intrathoracic pressure that is being created as a result of breathing in oxygen. So as soon as you have that negative 
intrathoracic you know, pressure being created as a result of when you are breathing in oxygen. The blood, the air is going to be sucked into the external carotid, external jugular vein. And so that air may now go into the heart. That means it will go into the right atrium, enter into the right ventricle before it now get distributed into the pulmonary trunk and what have you. So that air embolism is very, very dangerous condition and it may kill that person. The internal jugular vein can also be damaged, even though it is also situated inside the common carotid sheath, but it can also get... Uh, but the one thing with the cut of the veins, once you cut the vein now, the edges of the veins get collapsed. But in the situation whereby the veins pierces a fascia, the area where it enters into the fascia, once you cut that vein across that side, the lumen becomes open because there is a connective tissue around it preventing it from collapsing. So again, you know, I've talked about the vehicle plexus and the cervical plexus, you know, in the neck. And so damage to any of this can cause clinical conditions like damage to the EPS point of the brachial plexus. That one is going to cause what you call EPS chain paralysis. You know that in brachial, I mean in the clinical anatomy of the brachial plexus. Similarly, when you damage the C6, C7, and C8 root, you know, that can also damage our, you know, serratus anterior muscles because that is the long thoracic nerve supplying the serratus anterior muscle. If you want to push, as those people that used to push a wheelbarrow, if you want to push the scapula at the back, because the serratus anterior now helps in moving movement of the scapula, and so the scapula is going to be winged, what we call winging of the scapula as a result of the paralysis of the long thoracic nerve. That is C6, C7, and C, which is part of the brachial plexus. Similarly, you can also damage the upper root of the brachial plexus, so the upper trunk or the lower trunk, especially during assisted birth delivery, when you want to assist a woman to deliver the head of the baby. By the time you use the forceps, the metallic forceps, you may injure either the upper or the lower, you know, trunk of the brachial plexus. And so that may affect any part that is affected, the area is going to show. If it is the lower trunk, you know there are about five or six naps that are taking origin from the lower trunk. All this is your middle pectoral nerve, middle root of the median nerve, your uh, musculocutaneous nerve of the arm, musculocutaneous, uh, sorry, um, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, and also the, I think there are about five nerves, the ulnar nerve itself, that's the last one. So all these nerves are going to be affected as a result of the lower trunk injury of the uh, brachial plexus. For the upper trunk, you know, we have the three nerves coming from the upper trunk, you know, the lateral root of the median nerve, the lateral pectoral nerve, and the musculocutaneous nerve. These are the three nerves there that are also going to be affected when you have injury to the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. Cervical plexus, they supply the areas around the back of the neck you know, all this uh, skin around that side, you know, and, you know, so once the cervical plexus are also, it's also been damaged, so the sensation around the back of the neck, you know, is also going to be affected. Lymph nodes, you know, they drain the structures in and around, in and around the neck, both the superficial and the deep, they have connections, so they are interconnected. So once you see a lymph node enlargement in the neck, you have to be, make sure you have to, Definitely know that there must be, you know, an area of infection or inflammation around the neck. So, for example, now if you see a lymph node enlargement around the lower part of the head, this is what we call submandibular lymph node enlargement. Definitely, you know that something is going on in the mouth because the lower part of the head, the lymphatics, they go into the submandibular group of lymph node. Similarly, when you have superficial group of lymph nodes here, enlarged around this area, we have the anterior group, you have the posterior group. 
So if we have the posterior group of lymph node getting enlarged here, you know that here at the back of the neck, definitely there must be some, you know, problems in the either rashes appearing there or trauma. So also in the anterior part. When you see lymph node enlargement at the supraclavicular region here, you know that there must be some problems in the chest, especially at the apex of the lungs because they get contact or they get connected with the lymph node of the supraclavicular side. So also axillary lymph nodes, they also get connected with supraclavicular group of lymph nodes. So once you have lymph node enlargement along the supraclavicular area here, definitely you have to look for area of you know, problem along that area. So also, you know, the glands, the thyroid gland, which is located at the anterior part of the laryngeal cartilage here. That thyroid gland, you know, you know its functions. It releases T3 and T4. These are the hormones that are responsible for the metabolism of what we eat, the carbohydrate, protein, and whatever. So they are responsible for assisting and metabolizing the food that we eat and so the gland may get you know swollen what we call goiter you know so the goiter is a benign swelling of the thyroid gland and so you will see the swelling may be very small or may be very moderate in size or may be very large you will see some people in the market or in the town you will see them with very large swelling in the neck here very large one if the swallow something you'll see it's just moving so you know it is a thyroid gland enlargement and so you can remove the thyroid gland what you call thyroidectomy so it can be removed but then one can you must have to get some supplement of the hormones that that gland is you know uh, releasing one problem with this thyroidectomy that means that means removal of the thyroid gland the surgeon during surgery may damage certain neurovascular bundles. You know, in the neck here, that's what we call the recurrent laryngeal nerve that lies between the trachea and the esophagus. And it is located just around the posterior part of the uh, thyroid gland. So in trying to remove the thyroid gland, one may cut across the recurrent laryngeal nerve. I know recurrent laryngeal nerve is responsible for you know, phonation. It supplies some of the muscles, you know, of the phonation, muscles of speech. And so one may have what you call Hawass voice. You know, you know what is Hawass voice? Voice is very, is, 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 is very, you know, unaudible and it's not nice. You get it. So that's what you call Hawass voice. It's not a normal voice. And so similarly, the parathyroid gland can also get removed in trying to remove the thyroid gland. If you care, because they are very, very small glands, once you remove the thyroid gland, parathyroid gland, you know it's responsible for, you know, uh, calcium release. Once calcium level is depleted in the body, parathyroid gland is responsible for maintaining the calcium level in the circulation. And so excessive secretion of the parathyroid gland will now increase the level of the calcium in the circulation. And so you know calcium mostly is being mobilized from the bones. So hyperparathyroidism is associated with thinning of the bones. So much so that the bones will become very thin. So with small trauma, once you fall, no matter how small the fall is, you can easily fracture that bone because the bones are thin. You get it. And so these are some of the problems associated with the structures in the neck. One of the Common complaints of people in the neck is neck pain. Neck pain is very common. Every day you see people complaining of neck pain as a result of so many things. What we call myositis. I've already explained what is myositis, inflammation of the muscles because of disease or trauma. Physical strains, like maybe you are just using the neck, moving the neck anyhow, or once you are lying down, you are lying down on the floor that is very high or very low, so the neck may be mispositioned, you get it. Or abnormal or poor posture of the neck. Like when you fix your eyes on the computer, you know, for long, the neck muscles, they can get strained. 
and also that can also cause uh, neck pain. Similarly, mental stress. When you are just sitting down thinking too much, you know, and thinking, doing some research on what I do, or trying to solve certain problems, you sit for long. Excessive thinking of the brain can also cause some pains, pains in the neck as a result of the development of the nerve supplying the neck. Similarly, slipped discs, you know, between the vertebral bones, there are, there are what we call intervertebral discs. That intervertebral, those intervertebral discs, any one of them can get slipped out of the space between the two bones. You get it? So when you have slipped discs, that one can also impinge on any of the branches of the spinal nerve and may cause neck pain there. Similarly, you can have pinched nerve as a result of these slipped discs or maybe as a result of swelling in the neck can compress the spinal nerve and can cause you know, neck pain. Osteoarthritis as a result of the fracture of the bones or inflammation or infection of the bones as a result of trauma can cause osteoarthritis and the osteoarthritis of any of the vertebral bone can cause neck pain. Similarly, tumors like uh, the cancer of any of the structures around the neck like the bones, you get it, you can get cancer there. And any of the, like the thyroid gland can also get cancer, cancer of the thyroid gland or of the parathyroid. Any of these can cause neck pain, you get it. Also trauma that I said, trauma, when you have cut along the neck or boils or lymph node enlargement as a result of the infection somewhere, those one can also cause neck pain. You can also have neck swellings as a result of goiter, that thyroid enlargement or swelling. Can also have what you call lipoma. Lipoma is enlargement along the length of the neck as a result of the fatty deposit, you know, because the fats get deposited, you know, in the neck and can cause, you know, swelling of the neck. Lymph nodes also. Lymph nodes, you know, can also get enlarged, either the superficial cervical lymph node or the deep cervical lymph node can also get enlarged and so it can cause the next swelling. Similarly, pus as a result of tuberculosis, as I told you, pulmonary TB, you know, can also affect the bones, the vertebral bones, and they, it can also track up or track down if it begins from the neck, it can come down, it can come down, so pus can also cause a swelling in the neck. So there are several conditions that can affect, you know, you can also have what you call wry neck. That means you can have tilting of the neck towards one side as a result of, you know, problem with the sternocleidal mastoid muscles, stiffness of the sternocleidal mastoid muscles as a result of diseases or trauma. So these are the common conditions that I think people should know. So I'm going to have a break. So next time I'm going to continue with another form of clinical anatomy.